and welcome to our session. I want to begin by thanking all of you for being here. This is the one and only education presentation at the conference, so mm -hmm. we're most appreciative of the educators in the room for being here with us. Thank you. I am Cynthia Kuhlman. We're going to go a little bit more in depth with our introductions in a minute, but I also want you to know Dr. Nicole Patton Perry <coughs> mm -hmm. from the College of Education at uh, Florida State University, and Mr. Comer Yates, who is Executive Director of the Atlanta Speech School. And just as an overview, we're going to be talking about um, early learning as the foundation of great outcomes for life. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of including the latest research as you de develop your model. We're going to talk about how to engage, identify, engage, and evaluate partners in early learning work. Mm -hmm. And for those of you community quarterbacks in the room, Without an education background, we hope to give you uh, some strategies to identify best practices and to evaluate excellent outcomes for all children. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's start now with okay. the introductions. And um, Nicole, if you will, uh, let's like Comer go first. Sure. Oh. Gentlemen first this All right. time. Um, good morning, everybody. Maybe we can pull up the slide just quickly about our mm -hmm. school. Um, so I'm proud to be the executive director of the Atlanta Speech School. Real quickly, we're an 80-year-old institution. We started as a free school in 1938. Um, and over the past 80 years, we've never turned away a child because of financial uh, limitation. We are uh, in the business of the social justice of literacy. Um, on our campus, we have four schools and five clinics. Um, and our focus is on children who are going to struggle because of neurobiological differences, inefficiencies where reading is going to be a challenge or they're going to be in crisis for reading acquisition. The largest number of children with whom we work are children who are dyslexic. And uh, I can brag on my colleagues because it's their work, not mine, but I would dare say over this 80 years of work as practitioners, we've had access to the world's leading researchers on brain and language and literacy development. Nicole has been an invaluable partner in our work and as practitioners, I would say that we have constructed more reading brains for children who never should have acquired a reading brain, tens of thousands of children, than any other institution really in the world. Um, and we're fortunate as we work today, not only with our children on campus, we serve as the educational equivalent of a teaching hospital. We have a free, universally accessible online campus, not focused on children who have neurobiological differences, but focused on children whose families have experienced generational lack of access to educational opportunity or denied access to educational opportunity. And what has to happen for those children? What does the engagement of adults in their lives have to look like to break the cycle of illiteracy for those children? So we have our free online campus where 45,000 teachers of children birth to eight in 42 countries in all 50 states train on the campus for this purpose of ending our country's illiteracy epidemic. And we can talk more specifically about that as we go on. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Homer. Nicole? So my name is Nicole Terry. I grew up in Atlanta and am a new resident of Tallahassee, Florida at uh, Florida State University, where I'm a professor in the College of Education, as well as the Associate Director of the Florida Center for Reading Research. I come to this work from multiple backgrounds and fields, and I will say that I think the, the common thread across all of the ways in which I come to this work really does have to do with my own family story and how it is that we serve the children in our family and how I think that uh, if we can figure out ways to scale that up to a community and a neighborhood level, we can get a lot further if all of those children are our children. Um, I come at this work as a person who works in the College of Education, therefore I train teachers. I come to this work as a researcher, therefore I try to understand the conditions around why children thrive in school and what we can do to promote achievement as well as prevent underachievement. 
Um, I come at this work also as a parent. I have young children, and I'm very much so invested in how it is that they do in school as well as how all children in their school do. So I, I, I tend to take a very comprehensive uh, approach to the work because I take a, I, my place in the work is quite comprehensive. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. I'll give a little bit of my background. You may be able to tell by looking at us that I'm the most senior member of this team, bringing <laughs> a, a, almost 50 years in public education. I think I'm going into 49 this year. Um, I've had everything Bravo. from uh, being a second grade teacher and a special education teacher uh, to ending my career in Atlanta Public Schools as the principal of a wonderful elementary school that was also in a revitalized neighborhood. Um, I joined the CF Foundation, the Cousins Family Foundation, 13 years ago. At the same time, I joined <coughs> the board for the Drew Charter School. I now serve as chairman of that board. And I would say the most important thing I've done in my 13 years with the foundation is work tirelessly on the early education program. Everyone that knows me knows I consider it to be the very most important part of the cradle to college pipeline. Uh, we just completed our wonderful high school that you've heard about in the earlier presentation. And I always say we wouldn't have been there without having done the early education piece first. It really moved the trajectory for achievement in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Now that you know all of us, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to conduct this as a discussion. We just really enjoyed two wonderful presentations. So this will be a little bit of a different format, and we'll be talking among ourselves. And at the end, we'll give you a chance to ask some questions as well. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start with the first question uh, for Nicole first, but mm -hmm. I'd love for both of you to answer it. Why I is saw the gubernatorial debate for Florida last night. I hope we don't devolve <laughs> into <laughs> <I'm> that. <laughs> Okay. But anyway. No, I'm going to ask. We got our own issues in Georgia. I'm not uh, giving Florida a hard time. Go ahead. Okay. Why is early learning so important and why should everyone, regardless of industry, care about access to high quality early learning for children? I think if, if you can show the next slide, to me this is the most illustrative uh, way to do this. So these are all of the grandchildren in my family. I am one of seven children, which means that you end up with a lot of grandchildren. We're up to 19 now, and we did the unthinkable this summer, get them all in one place to take one picture. <laughs> in order, actually they're in birth order. The numbers on their shirt represent um, the number they are in the family. I think when you look at this family, there are some obvious differences amongst them, right? You see gender differences amongst them. You see temperament differences amongst them. You see age differences amongst them. But there are other things amongst them you can't see. You can't see that they live in different regions in this country. You can't see that one of, some of them have parents who are vice presidents at banks, and some of them have parents who are third grade teachers in Atlanta public schools. You can't see that there are children in this family who are performing two and three grade levels above expectation, and there are children in this family who are nonverbal, who have significant disabilities. There are children who have significant mental health concerns in this family. But despite all of this variation amongst the children in my family, as a unit, we have determined that no matter their circumstance, they will thrive. They will succeed, and it does not matter what barriers are in front of them. It doesn't matter what communities they live in and what resources that community has to bear upon their family. It doesn't matter what the economic circumstances are of that unit of the family. We all together have determined that all of these children will learn and will succeed and will thrive in life, no matter what. You flip the slide, what you see is that children who look like them don't generally get to do that. Um, I believe it was in Carol's presentation 
but one in five African American children and one in five children growing up in poverty are reading at grade level <coughs> by fourth grade. Pretty much any indicator of overall health and well-being and quality of life that you put in front of a family that looks like this suggests that they will not be thriving. And for my family, that is unacceptable. I think what is very important about the work that we're doing here is that we've all determined that it's unacceptable for us too. That all of these children in our communities belong to us and therefore no matter the circumstances surrounding them, we will ensure that they thrive. Early childhood becomes really important to that because it's a way to change the path. If you go to the next slide, you'll see. I think it's a, there are multiple strategies and you've heard about multiple strategies in this approach, but I think that early childhood is one of the most groundbreaking, <coughs> path-changing strategies you can put into play in any effort to improve outcomes for young children and families, especially those who are most vulnerable in our society, because you're talking about setting them on a path, on a trajectory for success and achievement. And it begins before birth. Right, and I think Dr. Joe probably, I hope, hit that home for you, that it begins before birth, it continues all the way through early learning, all the way through um, K to 12. It's how you set the stage, it's how you start with young children, it's the way you begin to engage their families, it's the way you begin to engage their communities. So I think it is a really powerful strategy for getting the outcome that we would like. I have the Ready Child Equation here for you, and it's, it's something you can Google and find, but it's one way of thinking about how early learning is a part of a system, because we're talking about whether or not, in order, if you want to answer the question of how well children are ready to succeed in school, you first need to ask how ready are the, the communities that they're in, how ready are schools to receive them, how ready are families to support them. Then we get to talk about how ready are children. So it has a lot to do with what's around them in order to make sure that they're ready to thrive in school. And I just, I am biased too, perhaps I'm also an educator as well, but I think it's one of the most powerful strategies you have to make that happen. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm. Comer, would you like to address that Sh issue sure. as well? Um, Frederick Douglass spoke a truth about 150 years ago when he said, once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. Um, National Institutes of Health, Reed Lyons said about 15 years ago, the truth in reverse, if you live in the United States and you can't read, you can't make it. Um, those are truths, but they're not, e the big thing to realize, and I hope all of that those are not eternal truths. Um, the ability to read that was not defining around a person's ability to thrive um, historically until 570 years ago when Gutenberg first mass produced print. Our brains were not required, there is no native function in our brains, there's no circuit in our brain by which we're gonna to learn to read. We have an auditory and a visual circuit, but what happens in those first years of life determines whether or not this novel, non-native reading circuit is going to happen or is not going to happen. Um, we're all born with about 150 billion neurons in our brains, but very few of them are attached together, and that's for a purpose, so that we learn to adapt to our environments and those right neurons correct, connect with the right other neurons to form synapses that allow us to decide our own futures in the kind of environment in which we live. And the fantastic news is for about 550 years, nobody really understood how to take advantage of Gutenberg's technology. What has to happen to construct this novel circuit of a reading brain? Well, in the last 20 years, Nicole and others have been able to identify irrebuttably what the interactions need to look like. What do the adult behaviors have to look like with children for every child to be able to read? And the data are now, the research is that all children can thrive, all children can read if our behavior with them constructs the parts of the brain that are gonna allow to do that. And that these brains are developing so fast, birth to five, that one million synapses are forming per second in children's brains based on or not connecting based on whether there's human interaction. So when does, quick question for y'all, when, when is the first stage of construction of the reading brain for a child? When does it start? Boy, good interaction here. I really feel, I feel the dynamic out there. When does it start? When does construction of the reading brain start? It starts in the last trimester of pregnancy when the auditory channel is complete and the baby is hearing the mom's voice. 
does the mom need to be talking to the baby in a high-pitched voice or a low-pitched voice? It makes a complete difference. <laughs> Which voice? High-pitched voice because the cochlea is a, is a shell-like organ sitting inside, the, sitting inside the ear and it's responding to the eardrum and the hair cells in the cochlea that respond to high-frequency fre sounds or on the outside of the cochlea, well, embedded deep in the cochlea are the hair cells that respond to low frequency sounds. Embedded in all that fluid in the womb and embedded in the fluid in the baby in the ear canal, if you say to your baby before delivery, I, I really want you to go to Harvard, Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay's, brain, Lindsay's brain never hears those sounds. If she hears, Lindsay! You extend that vowel sound, you, you clip off the consonants. I'm going to tell you what, this is life defining. By natural selection, this is what we do. It doesn't matter whether it's Japanese, any language, it's this high-pitched parentese. And in this last trimester, in the first year of life, these phonemes, the 44 sounds of the English language, are either mapped onto the brain or they're not mapped onto the brain based on this serve and return of language, 30,000 words a day served and return using this parent ease becomes defining because those 44 sounds are the absolute core of language and the construction of literacy. And by natural selection, we have done that, but unfortunately, particularly in our region of the country, we have disrupted this natural connection with children because we've had to exalt for too many of our children compliance over the children. And parents have been have, having to make a horrific choice by a society that's made it dangerous for their children if they're noticed or if they're considered to be non-compliant. So parents, instead of the high-pitched frequency of parentees, have had to use the loving words of stop that and put that down. Doing enormous damage two language components of the brain doing enormous damage to the prefrontal cortex around executive function as a result because children are hyper-regulated during the period where they have to build up a history of good choices in the prefrontal cortex. Pat Cool's work for the University of Washington. And so instead, in this Sophie's Choice for Parents, we've really disrupted language and literacy. So preschool is absolutely essential as a place to make sure that these foundational elements that are in place upon which to build reading around monitoring and teaching a reading brain, that foundation has to be in place. Mm -hmm. And if there's not a preschool that's paying attention to those, if you go to a preschool and they are not building children's phonemic awareness and phonological awareness in everything they're doing, they are low quality and they are inconsistent and what they're doing can't be morally, ethically, or neurologically defended. And you have con you've created a, a, a platform of quicksand upon which to construct a reading brain for children. So this birth to five window is not just something, it is everything. Thank you so much, Nicole and Comer. <laughs> Both wonderful testimonials to making the case for early education. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to transition at this point into a discussion about partnerships. Uh, in Eastlake, we have found it to be most successful to build our model through partnerships. We've talked about that earlier, and particularly in the early learning area. The first question is, what should attendees that are attempting to take on this work look for when selecting an early learning partner? And what about selecting a professional development partner? Now, I'm the moderator of the panel, but I've also <coughs> been advised that I could be a panelist too. Go so I'm going to try the first answer mm -hmm. to that question and give you a little bit about the history of the phenomenal early learning work taking place in East Lake, um, we recognized the East Lake Foundation recognized early on when beginning this work that early learning was important. 
So the day we opened our school in 2000, we also opened an early learning center, the Sheltering Arms Early Learning Center in Eastlake. And the team did a lot of research and determined and concluded that this early learning center had a real strong track record of success with the children like our target population, children who needed a very high quality early learning program. That program today serves 135 children, ages birth through four years of, of age, and it's supported through scholarships by the Eastlake Foundation, our community quarterback. When I joined the team in 2006, I was really supposed to come to build a high school. And when I really surveyed the landscape in our charter school, Drew, it was clear to me that we didn't need a high school yet. We needed to double down on early learning. Uh, the Sheltering Arms Center could send 40 students to Drew's 85 student kindergarten. Uh, Comer, with the support of the Rollins Center, which he leads, at the Atlanta Speech School was already the first committed partner to Drew Charter School. They were already there working on language and literacy, and I begged Comer to help us kick off additional high-quality early learning at Drew Charter School. And we started in 2007 with one class of 20 kids, they're sophomores now, and we had the time of our lives. I mean, it was just absolutely phenomenal. And we recognized uh, very early on about the need for building a vertical articulation. It was based in the school, and we were able to really make good strides with that class. Mm -hmm. Currently today, that is the Cox Pre-K at Drew Charter School. It serves 88 children. It grew year by year because we became quite popular in the neighborhood and quite effective at changing uh, the success rate for the kids in our school. In 2009, we, were, we recognized the importance of additional birth through three-year-old programs. So we partnered with our YMCA at East Lake. I was very spoiled from the school where I came from of having both sheltering arms and the YMCA providing early learning before they came to us. Mm -hmm. So the Y jumped on board. I believe Parrish Underwood is here in the room with us today. I hope so. He's back there. Thank you, Parrish. Mm -hmm in helping us build a birth through three-year-old program. All th they now serve 95 students in very high quality birth through three-year-old programs. All of us partner with the Rollins Center, Sheltering Arms, the Cox Pre-K, and the East Lake Early Learning Academy at the YMCA. So we are serving 325 students in high quality early education. All of our kindergartners now, almost all, can come to kindergarten ready to learn. So that's our success story, mm -hmm. thanks to our partnerships. Mm -hmm. Georgia State University, where Nicole was associate professor, uh, was a great partner in developing all of that and to helping us evaluate the work as we go. Comer, you wanted to add? Well, I have to add, uh, <laughs> yesterday when they showed, when Carol showed the slide cradle um, to college as the centerpiece of the work at Eastlake, Don Duran, who leads all education uh, at Drew, and I were sitting at the same table and instinctively, we looked at each other and then we both looked at Cynthia um, because she is the author of The Cradle to College 
commitment and her dedication. So the first thing to look for in a partner mm -hmm. um, is ability, expertise, and unconditional commitment to children. And, um, you know, I could go on with more descriptions of Cynthia, mm -hmm. um, but that's probably for now um, the place to, to start um, around what she's done. The only correction I would have for Cynthia um, is that they aren't serving just 300 and something children. Um, the Cox pre-K and what's going on in Eastlake with those 300 and something children is the epicenter of our work um, across the world. 45,000 teachers are on the Cox campus because of Cynthia and what started at Drew. So when you're thinking about having a purpose-built community, um, uh, since I'm from the hometown of Martin Luther King, uh, and the quote, we're all tied together by a single garment of destiny. Um, these purpose-built communities are not just impacting hundreds and hundreds of children. You're setting a sample, an example and a model to say enough's enough for every child. We're just not going to tolerate what we've been doing to children in most instances, for too many instances, for 399 years. Um, it's time to apply the science. So, um, you know, understand the impact well beyond children in any particular community. Um, and so looking for that partner in Tom Cousins who were going to be unconditional, because the biggest danger in the world, by the way, y'all, is to do things with imprecision, not followed by the research. And after centuries of failure, all you'll do with these imprecise measures, handing out books to have a book driver, telling parents who can't read that they've got to read 20 minutes a night to your ch their children, all you're going to do is just add on to the inequity that's already existed by having people draw inferences around children's race, color, or zip code, around where they, how they can be effective because you haven't applied the science. So you just can't allow for any false negative outcomes. Um, the science is too clear on what needs to be done, and maybe that's a good introduction for Nicole. Yes, Nicole, please go on to tell us how to create strong, successful partnerships between higher education institutions and schools as well. Okay. Though, since she let me go, I'm just going to add. <laughs> um, I think uh, the other thing to think about when you're looking for early learning partners, I think there are four key things to look for. One is what um, Comer just said in terms of making sure you're looking for evidence of quality, and, and I mean hard numbers. You want to know whether or not what is happening in the building is actually <coughs> making a difference for children and for teachers and for families, and you want to be able to demonstrate that and you want to be critical of it. Um, the second is I think you want to partner an early learning provider who has a relationship with the K-12 school system. If you're looking at or if you're considering early learning partners in your area and they don't know someone at the local school district, they don't know the principal of the schools in the area, they don't know the superintendent, that is a problem. Because if you're going to create a cradle to career pipeline, then that false divide that happens on September 1st when children turn five and get to go kindergarten is just that. It's false. It's just another day. It should be a seamless pathway. Um, the third thing I think you should do is make sure you're insisting on quality. It's just as the discussion we had yesterday around housing, that we are going to build units that you would want to live in, where you're going to create schools and early learning centers where you will send your own children. So you must insist on quality, and it's non-negotiable. And I would say the final thing that you want to think about um, as it relates to partners you want to pick early learning centers as well as partners who know how to work in these communities with vulnerable children and families, and not everyone knows how to do that. That's particularly true in the early learning space, because early learning functions very differently than K-12. to Early learning spaces, often in birth to five, these are businesses. These are their, their, their uh, sources of employment for people who live there. They're sources of income for the folks who run those agencies often. And sometimes it, quality doesn't rise to the top for them. A lot of times it's about making sure they're getting people in and filling slots. And that's not a bad thing, but if you are not approaching that from a lens of understanding how to promote um, early learning for young children, then you might not be the best partner for this work. Because what this work suggests is that your bottom line isn't the dollars. Your bottom line is whether or not those children are graduating from high school and moving on into college. Your bottom line is actually about 15 years later, right? So you want to pick partners who understand that. I think 
in um, the East Lake community, the wine sheltering arms are excellent examples of partners who understood that. So they know how to do that work because they've been doing it for a very long time. As a person in a university trying to create a partnership here, I think one thing that's key to understanding is that universities are big places with lots of people in them, and we do not all know each other. So for example, Dr. Joe, who you guys just heard from, I, she, we both work at Florida State. I've never met her. I've never been to the College of Medicine at Florida State. Now, I've only been there three months, but that's because it's a huge institution, right? What you're trying to do with universities is the same as what you're trying to do with these partners that you have here in housing and health and early learning. You're trying to help people see their place, their role in this work. So universities are resources to their community. They have expertise in how to teach teachers. They have expertise in social policy. They have expertise in gathering data. They have expertise in health. They have expertise in a lot of different areas. I think what you want to do is look in your local communities, look for university partners all the way across the board. Don't just go to the president. Don't just go to the provost, because those are the highest people up in the university. Sure, you want their buy-in, but the work actually happens on the ground. So you want to start looking in those colleges and universities for places for people to connect, to feel like they have some ownership in this work. I think we have real examples of that in the work we did in Eastlake. Had a partnership with the College of Music, right? Yes. Where they were coming in and, and supporting students with uh, harp lessons and all kinds of well, things, right? Well, and they're in parish can testify to the Georgia State um, students who come and teach music to mm -hmm. the two-year-olds and three-year-olds at the Early Learning Center. Right, which uh, had nothing to do with my partnership with them, though I was at Georgia State fulfilling a different role for Drew and a different role for the East Lake community. So I think it's about trying, it's, universities are just the same. You can use them as a resource. What you have to help them see is what's their role. How can they play in this and be successful in that role? And that work goes from early ed through 12th grade. That's right. Universities want to help in schools right. and they do make great partners. But while before we leave this, we've talked about the successful model at Drew, but I do want to say a little bit more about the Rollins Center because the Rollins Center kicked this off with us and they are constantly present. We have a facilitator for Rollins that is constantly working with our teachers to create that language rich environment to keep them abreast of all the latest research in early education to really help them help others. So one of our messages to you all this morning is we're here for you. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done this and we want to mm -hmm. be able to be helpful to the network members who are here today. Do you mind just hitting that? Maybe you could just show the slide of the Cox campus yes. so that you could, so there. I, mean, there's, I mean, this is the campus. Again, you can just log on at coxcampus.org um, and you're in. Um, and we have a whole community of practice in Kingston, Jamaica, where 45 teachers are, have created their own coaching system at no cost to them. I mean, they're, they're, they're communities that practice all over the country around this. Um, around this amazing resource that the Woodruff Foundation and the Cox Foundation and others have made possible. And this isn't our research, it's the application of Nicole's research, Julie Washington at Georgia State, Marianne Wolf, uh, and others um, to bring this to, to teachers. One thing I just would really emphasize, just feel important, when somebody, if you're trying to start a preschool program and you ask, well, what is quality? Everybody will sit and nod their head, but really understanding what quality is is critically important. And far too many of our states, my perspective, um, that quality is defined by two measures that really I think are incredibly antiquated called itters and eckers, um, that measure childhood progress, but really don't relate directly to the brain research around reading construction. Um, language and literacy development is one very narrow band of itters and eckers and other scoring can have an institution look like a quality place, but it's not quality for a child who's been caught in this generational cycle of lack of access. So understanding what do they really mean by quality. For us, when we think about quality, we think about connection. If you remember back in the womb, 
mom and baby are so closely connected, baby doesn't even forget a sound that mom makes. So if you walk into a center and their focus is on compliance of the children, how they walk down the hall, how much they raise their hand, rather than these social bonding and serve and return. The four things we look for in a preschool, we're looking for are they pushing in and pulling out language, are they building executive functions, are they building critical thinking, and are they building empathy. And they should be doing all four of those things in every single transaction with every child. If you walk into a center, and I've been in with mayors of various cities, you walk into a center and they claim they're high quality, and you walk into a, a classroom and two or three kids come and wrap their arms around your leg, I can't tell you how many mayors and other officials have walked out of that room and said, oh, isn't it so sweet how affectionate the children are? And I go, oh my God, don't you see? These children are so starved for human connection that they've reached out to strangers to somehow try to bond. This is a dangerous, toxic place. And th there's no quality going on here. And everybody ought to grab your child and run for your life. I mean, that is not how we build children's brains. And we've completely disrupted human relationships in the name of something that's not about the best interest of our children. Thank you, Comer and Nicole. Mm -hmm. We have one final question, which Carol Naughton made us promise to ask each of our panelists. And that is, if you were king or queen of the world, what's the one thing you would immediately do to improve outcomes for early learners? You want to go first? Are you sure you don't want to go first? <laughs> go first. Uh, uh, let me just say, as a researcher, I hate the whole one thing question. Because <laughs> it's never one thing. <coughs> it's always multiple things. But. I, the one thing I would do was ensure that there was equitable dis distribution of resources to promote quality. And that's three parts of that, because it's not just one thing. Equity matters. Everyone does not need the same thing to thrive. And we need to ensure that we're directing our best resources, which are social, human, fiscal source resources, to those who are most in need. So I would, and I would insist on quality because quality matters. If you're not in there doing things at high quality, then you're wasting your time. So I would go for equitable distribution of resources to promote quality. Comer? Well, for, after appointing you Secretary of Education, um, <laughs> czar of education, um, the one thing, this would be an eternal truth and somebody talked about faith. Um, you know, you think about the parables of the Bible um, and these parables um, told um, to be life-defining always began with a word that was listen. Um, they never get, began with be quiet. Um, and <laughs> there were, Jesus was asked one time to silence children um, in his life in the temple where uh, the children were praising him for turning over the tables. And when they asked him to shut up the kids, he said, well, don't you know, I think he quoted Psalm 8, don't you know it's the voices of children that find the path to heaven? Well, if I were king or queen, um, my wish would be, or order would be, we would never silence another person's child, um, ever. Um, there's absolutely, again, no neurological, moral, or um, ethical justification for it. We live in a region where the silencing of children was a means of, of forming an economic system that would have them be chattel and bearers of chattel. And 400 years later in Atlanta, only 17% of our African American children are proficient readers compared to 73% of our white children. Uh, those numbers are not much different than the rest of your, your cities as well. So um, asking our children to develop respect for each other, to really connect with each other, um, asking them to be silent will take their voices away for the rest of their lives. So that would be mine. Thank you, Comer. I knew that would be yours. <laughs> I know you well. Well. Um, and now you're the king and we're the queens. And to conclude our session, I'm gonna have a wish for all of you. 
Homer, I remember when Bobby Cagle came to visit the Cox pre-K, and he said his wish, he was the commissioner of early education at the time, his wish would be for every pre-K in Georgia to be like the Cox pre-K. Mm -hmm. And I was very pleased about that. So my wish is that every one of the 20 network members can rely on us to get where we have come in early ed with the East Lake Early Learning Academy, mm -hmm. the Sheltering Arms Center, and the Cox Pre-K, so that all of your children will be uh, on that, have that great foundation for success in life. Mm -hmm. So I believe it's now time to have some questions yes. and we are here to try to answer them. And by the way, if you don't believe it works about not silencing children, come see these four pre-K classrooms at Drew, uh, and you'll see what it means. In the early development of the early childhood movement in Atlanta, um, were you able to come up with any kinds of innovative solutions around compensation of the teachers um, in a lot of contexts, as you all know very well, um, there's teacher sh shortage and early childhood teachers aren't even compensated at the levels of K through 8 teachers or K through 12 teachers. So did you have any innova uh, innovative ideas around compensation or, um, you know, maintaining, attracting and maintaining those people, et cetera? We did a year of research uh, at the Rollins Center prior to making any moves in early education, and that was one of the variables that we researched, and they talked about the importance of compensation um, and why would you pay the least amount of money at the portion of the pipeline that is the most important part of the pipeline. So we have made every effort by combining public funding and philanthropy to raise the compensation level of our early education mm -hmm. teachers. They are on the same pay scale with the other teachers. Our early learning partners at the East Lake Early Learning Academy are making the same strides. And the real progress, though, comes with advocacy. Mm -hmm. We all need to stand up for this. Mm -hmm. And our commissioner of early education in Georgia now has looked to models like the Cox Pre-K and the East Lake Early Learning and has advocated for improved salaries for early learning teachers in Georgia. So we all need to take a strong stand on that. I remember 10 years ago hearing Nicole, nine years ago, saying when somebody said, what's the issue? And, and Nicole said, we have to professionalize the profession. It, without that, nothing else matters. I would give the warning from our perspective, one of the bad things that's been done is to um, attach the idea of professionalizing the profession with having all teachers birth to five have college degrees given the generally sorry state of higher education and training teachers um, with such limited development of children's abilities around language and literacy, demanding those college degrees when there's no data showing a correlation between those degrees and impact on children birth to five, I'd be very careful. Not every place is Georgia State or Florida State. And horrifically, what it's done, particularly with infant and toddler teachers, it's gentrified the, the, the profession teachers themselves who were denied their own access to literacy proficiency can be brilliant language and literacy teachers to infants and toddlers by being in oral language conversation with the children. We have places where those brilliant teachers are being taken out of the workforce, replaced by poorly trained college graduates. I mean, you just can't make up the stupidity of that. But Comer, I will say then every early learning center needs a Rollins Center because your team 
has done an excellent job of training our teachers in those relevant areas on how to do those things. In some cases, the teachers really need to find their own voice, and I feel like the facilitators from Rollins have done a great job with that. Nicole, I think you wanted to say something. You were on the edge of your I'm seat I'm on the there. edge of my seat. As a person who is a professor in a college of education, I'm going to respectfully disagree with that. Um, I so I it. do, the, there, there is variation in quality in higher education like there is in any <coughs> other profession. Um, I, instead, I see it as an opportunity to partner with colleges of education and other places that are there to support the development of these professionals. And I do think that uh, while we struggle, we have struggled in Atlanta around compensation, I think some of the best work that we've done is try to figure out ways to take the workforce part of what we're doing to support professionalizing these individuals. These are individuals often, given the level of pay that they've had, as well as their own backgrounds and where they live and where they grow up, they are often the working poor, the very group of people we're all trying to improve outcomes for. That's who these individuals often are. And so they themselves often need pathways towards career and, and towards development of themselves. And so by partnering with universities and other providers in our communities, we can use this as an opportunity to provide support to those individuals to improve their own outcomes. It really is a, a two-generation approach where you're not only supporting children, but you're also supporting their families and their parents and the professionals who work with them. Um, so I, I do think that I don't disagree with um, moves that folks are making to assist on degrees for those who are working with our youngest children. I don't disagree with that move. Um, but I do think that there will be consequences to those types of decisions and what we have to do is figure out how to set up partnerships so that there are no cracks in the system yeah. for the professionals just as we do for the children. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. We're just in systems right now where they fired teachers um, and it's doing just immeasurable damage to the children in the near term because there was no, there was no path um, to professionalism for those teachers and the children are suffering as well. Do we have another question? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Nick Bankston from Columbus, Ohio. Um, just want to thank you all. Um, I had a chance to visit uh, these pre-K centers you guys are talking about in East Lake, and uh, it's phenomenal. So um, kudos to the work that you guys are doing. Uh, right now in Columbus, and my question is really more about how do we um, help communities embrace this? Um, so right now in Columbus, or in really in the state of Ohio, we're moving towards a system where it's called star rating, and if you're not at a certain star rating by a certain time, you won't be able to receive um, federal funding, which a lot of these smaller um, pre-K centers or child care centers depend on. Basically, are there any strategies or ideas on how do we help the community uh, move to this and understand it um, and, and not being, and how do we get, bring them along as well? Because what we're seeing in some of the neighborhoods I work in is that, you know, the mom and pop places, there's a, a personal or community connection there um, although it's not high quality and they're not getting the um, uh, learning skills that we know that are necessary, are there strategies or skills and even communication tools that you have seen to help bring communities along um, with this process and also to encourage communities um, who um, naturally or historically didn't send their kids to pre-K uh, or see the benefit in it and getting them uh, to that level as well? Thank you, Cole. Um, I think one really powerful partner in that push is the early learning provider. And, and by that I mean often I think what has been um, wonderful to witness in Atlanta with both the YMCA as well as with Sheltering Arms. Is these are, so these are the largest Head Start providers in Metro Atlanta. So they have a lot of centers that they run and they serve two to 3,000 children a year. But because of that capacity, they're able to take a model of wraparound services and apply it to a community. And part of their charge in that work is engaging the other smaller providers. Um, and certainly it's not easy work. There are real issues around competition. There are real issues around the quality of the workforce and how it might differ in these entities. But they're able to establish strong partnerships with local providers simply because we all know supply and demand in our area. There are more children to serve than there are slots to hold them. So we actually need both of you at the table in order to serve all of the children. So I think they've done a really good job of 
of, of reaching across the table and making a lateral move instead of coming in from the top or coming in from the bottom. We are equal professionals here. We serve the same families and the same children. We want the same outcomes. How can we take the resources I might have as a larger provider and bring that to bear on, you, on the same challenges that you're seeing so all boats rise with the tide? So I think that's been a, a really powerful strategy in Atlanta. Can I just add, I mean, I'd urge to find out your, if your star rated system is based on itters or eckers or something similar, um, I would urge that all boats aren't going to rise together because it's not going to measure interactions between adults and children that are really about the brain science. Uh, they're going to be hyper focused on other elements of learning. Um, and children who come to school in that kind of imprecision and outdated measure who come with language experiences because they had generational access will be able to, in this imprecise learning environment defined as high quality, will be able to attach their language experiences and knowledge and vocabulary from home with imperfection and instruction and be able to thrive. The rest of the children are gonna be left behind and they're gonna be deemed high quality centers. And then when reading scores don't get any better, uh, there's still disparities. Again, inferences are going to be drawn and said, well, it was a high quality center. So if kids didn't improve, it must have been about a, an indicia of theirs, uh, not what we failed to do. So just because there's a star rated system, and I think 37 states use itters and eckers, I mean, it is a, an, it's an enormous problem to be using this outdated measure of what constitutes quality. So I will add, there is, there's actually a new Eckers and there's a new Itters along the way and both of them have um, increased the number of indicators associated with interactions. Um, I-T-E-R-S and E-C-E-R-S. There is an Eckers 3 that has just come out. There is an Itters 3 that is coming. They're doing the validity um, studies on it as we speak. Um, so those measures are improving based on some of the things um, Comer's talking about. I think it's also important to keep in mind that every star rating system in every state is not based on one measure. They're all based on multiple measures, <coughs> which they should be if they want to give you some indication of quality. The third thing I will say, and anyone who does research in early childhood and looks at quality indicators, what you will find is that the majority of those measures don't always correlate with or predict child outcomes because they're measuring different things. So oftentimes in early learning space, as well as in, in the K-12 space, we're looking for measures that capture the environment we're putting children in and we're not always directly assessing young children. Now there are real issues around how it is you assess young children. That's a whole nother presentation. But there's a, there is real scientific reason behind why often the quality measures don't necessarily relate to child outcomes. That does not mean we should not have them. Because you do need some level of indication as to what environments we're putting children in. And I do believe that the quality rating systems that are coming out are at least an attempt, an approach to try to do that and try to do it with some level of standard across the board. And that's not something we've had in the early learning space for years. So making, even getting to that point, despite its limitations, is a huge win for states. And it is a huge win for your local, your local providers because it gives you a place to start the conversation. And if they're designed well, they're not, they are designed for accountability. Can't get away from that. But they are so, are, if they're designed well, they're designed to have conversations about improvement. So where is it, can we improve the conditions we're putting children in to ensure readiness? And one thing to do, I think, Nicole, you had a was talking to Gary Bingham, your colleague, the other mm -hmm. day, about the ability to disaggregate the language and literacy sections of mm -hmm. the Eckers 3 mm -hmm. in combination with the overall score could be a very effective way of, mm -hmm. of, of doing both without expending yes. more money. Right. And be able to look at both because, again, the general Eckers rating is not a path to literacy. No. Mm -hmm. We have just learned that our time is up, but two things. <laughs> I want to say, I would love to, to thank you for your attention. You've been a wonderful audience. 
the lights are so bright, we can't really see all of you, but your questions have been great, and thank you very, very much for your engagement. Mm -hmm. Ending on a little less technical note, I'd love to commend the West Lakes community as we drove through to see the site of their new early learning center and talking about community engagement how they have posters throughout the community so everyone's going to become at ease with this and all parents are going to want their children uh, to attend and that's exactly what we found in east lake if we just got the first 20 kids through we didn't need to promote ourselves anymore the parents the grandparents everyone helped us with that so thank you very much we do i have been asked to remind you that lunch and the next session will begin at noon we have a short break where you can uh, freshen up and we'll see you at noon <laughs> thank, thank you, you.